our Bibles to a text that is familiar to us all. I'm going to pluck out of the unit of thought a serious thought for the hour. Luke's Gospel, chapter 2. Our focus text will be verses 15 through 20. In a moment, we will read those verses. But let me introduce them to us for just a moment. We have all gone through what we call the Christmas season. We have uh, gone out and faithfully, diligently, uh, with a serious interest in each gift that we've purchased, we bought the gifts, we've trimmed the tree, we've placed the gifts under the tree, we've had family over, we've had the time of rejoicing together and celebrating the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. The rush is over. The push is set aside for another 12 months. <laughs> so after Christmas, what do we do? Biblically speaking, from a Christian perspective, what ought we do? How should our response be? As Francis Schaeffer used the term so often, how should we then live? What should be the mandate of our lives based on the Christmas story? Stand, if you will, please, out of honor and recognition of the reading of the Word. I'm going to read verses 15 through verse 20 in Luke's Gospel, the second chapter. The Bible says, And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go, even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all that they heard it, all that heard it, wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds, verse 20, and the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Thank you, and we may be seated. What's the challenge of the hour that is before us? What should be the challenge for each of us as we look back in retrospect as to the Christmas story and what God has said to us through his word? Keep in mind now the first 14 verses in this chapter, chapter 2, is the birth story, the arrival of the first Christmas. Mary and Joseph had left because of the decree that had gone out that they needed to go into the city of David to be taxed as all the world was to be taxed in that era. Uh, there was no room for Mary and Joseph in the inn. Jesus was born in a stable in Bethlehem, and the shepherds out in the field watching their flocks by night, they were the first ones to be told the wonderful story of Jesus Christ, Yeshua Messiah, coming into the world. The promised Messiah for centuries had ultimately arrived. They received the story. How did they respond? What did they do? How should that relate to us in this hour, in these moments, in these days in which we are living in? I want us to think for a moment on the challenge of Christmas, the challenge of Christmas. I want us to notice in this study together the shepherd's personal decision recorded. Secondly, the shepherd's personal dedication revealed. And thirdly, the shepherd's personal delight reviewed. Notice in that 15th verse, the shepherd's personal decision recorded. Listen very carefully. They were simply, as you and I would call it, they were minding their own business. They were doing their own thing. They were out in the fields at night. They were watching their uh, shepherd. They were watching their sheep guarding over them. They were watching the flock by night. And Jesus has just been born. The uh, virgin's womb had been the vehicle by which the Lord Jesus Christ, God incarnate, had come into the world. And the announcement was made by the angels about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. May I say to us, as we think on that, and as we look at the setting and the context, there's just something about the name of 
Jesus. That announcement was made. The heavenly choir had been singing and praising God of the Savior's coming into the world. There's just something about that name, as the song says. An angel announced his birth. An angelic choir had sang about his birth. The shepherds saw him after his birth. The wise men submitted unto him. They worshipped him and they praised him. The king feared him. Mary submitted to him. Simeon adored him. Our calendar was changed because of him. And the song says, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. And that's what the, the shepherds had just heard. That's what they have just been told. That's the announcement that has just gone out to them. And now we see their response and what they're going to do in relationship to it. Notice their anxiousness in that 15th verse. The scripture says that they had a business meeting. They called together a conference. They voted on what they should do. <laughs> doesn't say that, does it? It says, let us now go. There was an anxiousness on behalf of the shepherds after they heard the good news of the Savior's birth. They are faced with the challenge. What should be the response to this announcement? Such a message, such a grand, glorious message that Jesus Christ has come into the world. What ought to be the response of these shepherds and how should it respond and how should it redound to our understanding and benefit and blessing even today? There was an urgency in their attitude. They didn't have a debate. They didn't have a delay. Uh, they uh, uh, were not asking no questions. They were simply wanting to act and make a decision. May I remind us, we're faced with the very same personal decision to be made today. What do we do? How do we respond to the announcement of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ? Albeit, that's been over 2,000 years ago, but as we celebrate Christmas, it's afresh and anew in that announcement. How are we to respond? How should we relate to that uh, good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Here's the good news. They have been told, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. That's the good news that's been announced. That's the message of the hour. That's what they have heard. That's what the angel had announced to them. And there's an anxiousness in their hearts. There's an anxiousness in their response. Let us now go. But I want you to notice not only their anxiousness, but I want you to notice their action. Their action. They said, let us now go. Go is an action word. You can't, say, you can't say, well, uh, folks, you go and you witness to others, now stay home and pray. There's nothing wrong with praying. But there is an anxiousness in the voice, in the hearts, and in the minds of these lowly shepherds as they've heard the good news of the Savior that's come into the world. And they said, let us now go. There's an anxiousness in their voice. There's an action in their minds. They're willing to uh, take, from, uh, take up from where they are and to go to where they have been told that they would find the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen very carefully as we look at this text. Not only is go a action word. Go is an action word. We cannot sit in a darkened society and say that it's not our responsibility to go and tell the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ to others. We cannot sit and say, let John do it, let Sally do it, let someone else do it. It's our responsibility for us to be willing with an anxious heart, with an action in our lives to go and tell the good news. The urgency was, let us now go and tell the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. May I remind us when we look at the situation that we're in in the nation, when I see the uh, signs that are about us and the indicators pointing to where we're going and what's taking place in America. This is more relevant today, I believe, than in the history of the United States of America in this text. Let us now go while we still have religious liberties and freedom of speech to do so. Let us now go while we still have health and opportunity and some will listen and some will say no. Let us now go while we still have the freedom and the comfort uh, in our homes and in our families to confront evil. Let us now go while we still have law and moral order that is left in our society. Let us now go 
while we still have some vestige of constitutional uh, constitutionality left in our nation, in our land. Let us now go while we still have a few patriots that's left that's willing to stand for truth and to fight for that which is righteous and honorable. Let us now go while we still have biblical and fr uh, biblical freedom to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. Let us now go while we still have our churches open and the religious uh, uh, persecution abated at least for a little while. Let us now go while we still have a nation with borders that we can say that we're representing the Lord Jesus Christ in the United States of America. Let us now go while we still have a nation that needs to be reached and redeemed with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us now go while we still have a nation that's not overcome by Islamic uh, uh, jihadist and the uh, socialist communist Marxist that's out to destroy the United States of America. Let us now go while God still listens and answers prayer. Let us now go while there's still opportunity and privilege that we have in America to do so. These shepherds said, let us now go. There's an anxiousness in their minds. There's an anxiousness in their hearts. There's a willingness to go and to tell what they have heard and what they have seen. Let us now go was the anxiousness and the activity and the action that's found in their lives. We have a greater opportunity today than in the history of America to tell the world about Jesus Christ. And we go through nonchalantly the Christmas season each and every year. We go through as though this is coming and it'll come again next year. We go through the celebration of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude, with a lackadaisical laid-back attitude that it ought not to affect anything in our lives. We hear the story that we've heard over and over and over, year after year after year, and century after century. We hear the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, but it seemingly does not affect any change in our lives as Christians today as it did in the lives and the hearts and the minds of the shepherds of that day. Let us now go. There was an urgency in their lives. There was an urgency in their hearts. They were ur there was an urgency for them to see and to hear and to find what they'd been told by the angels. We live in a society today we need to be willing to go to the crowds and go to the masses and go to friends and relatives and neighbors and friends and family members and share the good news, the gospel of the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. Mark's Gospel, the 16th chapter and the 15th verse, Jesus challenged to the disciples then. It's applicable today. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go is an action word. We cannot sit and be idle. We cannot sit nonchalantly and say, let the world go by and we have no responsibility. Everyone under the sound of my voice and beyond this uh, worship center today, everyone that hears this message, we have the responsibility we're saved to be as the shepherds of old saying to the world, let us now go and share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Part of the great commission is to go. Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 and following. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into the mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And they, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even even unto the end of the world. Part of the Great Commission is to go and tell. The Great Commission relates to you and to me. It's not just for some, it's not just for a few, but it's for everyone under the sound of my voice, for everyone that said yes to Jesus Christ. In John chapter 20 and verse 21, Then said Jesus unto them, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. That's the great commission call in your life and in mine. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, the Bible says, But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be, a wit be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and in Samaria and under the uttermost parts of the earth. That's the responsibility of the child of God today. Just as the shepherds of old, we ought to have that passion and that mindset and that zeal and that zest for serving the Lord Jesus Christ that says, I'm going 
going to do something about it. That is the commission of the Lord Jesus Christ to us, and that's the challenge of Christmas in this Christmas story, is to go and tell. The shepherd's personal decision. May I remind us we must reach them, and we must reach them soon, or it'll be too late. There are multitudes today in the millennial generation, 18 to 35-year-old age group, generally speaking. There's a multitude of those that have never heard the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. There are multitudes that have heard it, but because they were not taught it, they were not told it, they were not challenged by it, they were not seeing it lived out in the lives of moms and dads. As a result of that, they're silenced today in multitudes of homes in relationship to the challenge of Christmas, and that's to go and tell. This is the reason out of that same age group, only 4% have a biblical worldview today because of not being willing on the parts of parents and grandparents and friends and relatives and neighbors that say that we know Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord, not seeing it modeled out in our lives to go and tell a lost, dark, and dying society that a Savior has been born. Jesus Christ has come. He died on Calvary's cross, shed his rich red royal blood, that through his death, burial, and resurrection and our faith and trust in him by the grace gift of God that we can have eternal life, salvation so full and free. The shepherd's personal decision recorded. But I want you to notice the shepherd's personal dedication revealed in verses 16 and following. What did they do? They said, let us now go. They go and they find the Lord Jesus Christ personally. And then they sit in silence. Is that what the Scripture says? No, 10,000 times no. It's an impossibility to find Jesus Christ. It's an impossibility to know Jesus Christ and be silent after finding, after seeing, after being introduced to him. It's an impossibility to live in silence. Notice what the Scripture says in verse 16 and 17. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, personal experience, when they had seen it personally, when they had visited there and saw Jesus Christ personally, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. May I remind us what was it concerning the child? Verse 10, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. That's what they had been told. And they go with haste. They go with an anxiousness. They go with action to find the Lord Jesus Christ. The activity, we well, notice in that 17th verse, they made known abroad. What does that mean? <laughs> what does it mean they made known abroad? Literally, they told everybody, everybody they met, everybody they were introduced to, everybody that crossed their paths, everybody that they did business with, everybody that they communicated with, everybody in their family, all of their friends and all of their neighbors and all of those that they were meeting on a day-by-day -day basis, they shared that good news that a Savior has come. Jesus Christ is his name. Acts chapter 26, verse 1 and following. We'll not turn to it through verses 24. The Apostle Paul, as he would meet someone, as he came in contact with kings and governors, the Apostle Paul shared the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. He didn't give three points in a poem. He didn't even do expository preaching. He just simply said, once I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. This is what has come into my life. I found Jesus Christ, Yeshua Messiah. He saved me. <laughs> and yet so often as Christians, we fail to recognize what we have in Christ, what he's done for us in his death, burial, and resurrection, and through our faith and trust in him. We've been saved, saved, saved. What does that mean? We've missed hell and gained heaven as a result of saying yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. I want you to understand in this story, in this text, we need to recognize they were not concerned for being politically correct. 
They were not concerned about whether or not they could say something about Jesus in a public forum. They were not concerned about whether or not the Bible could be taught in public school or where prayer had been banned. They were not concerned about the politicians, the governors and the mayors that wanted to lock the churches down. They were, they were not concerned with that. They simply were concerned with the fact we've been given this good news that Jesus Christ has come. We want everybody to understand it, to hear it, and to know it. Perhaps you've heard me tell the story of a friend of years ago. His name was Fred. Fred uh, had rheumatoid arthritis. His joints were so bad that he could hardly walk. Some days he couldn't even put on a pair of shoes because of it. His hands were like gigantic knuckles sticking out all over his joints. But on Saturday, Fred would go out in the neighborhood and the community and knock on doors and pass out gum and candy to the kids and tell them, boys and girls, if you'll be here on this street corner at this place or at this stop sign, in the morning I will pick you up. And every Sunday morning he'd drive the uh, church Sunday school bus, fill it up with boys and girls, bring them into church. He was there on Tuesday evenings for uh, outreach and evangelism. And on one of those Tuesday evenings, he came in and could barely walk. And I said, Brother Fred, I understand your condition. I understand what you're faced with. I understand that if you can't come because of your physicality, I understand that. Don't feel that you must be here because of satisfying me or others. Big old tears in his eyes. He said, Preacher, I can't not come. I must go and tell about Jesus. That kind of passion that kind of commitment, that kind of surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ is rare today. Brother Fred invested his life, regardless of his condition, in going and telling the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. These shepherds weren't bashful. They were not afraid that someone would say something about them. They were not afraid that somebody's going to run them off because they had something to say to them about the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were not afraid to share the good news that Jesus Christ has come. They became the first active witnesses and soul winners for the gospel of Jesus Christ. They practiced personal evangelism in the greatest sense. One-on-one -on -one evangelism. You see, there's no place in the Word of God that says you need to meet on Monday evenings at the church, have a cup of coffee and two donuts, and go out and knock on three doors and come back and say, nobody's at home, here's my report. Sounds like what happens many times in most churches. Not any place in the Scripture says you need to go out on Tuesday night or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday or Saturday morning. It's not recorded in the Scripture. But while going, you disciple... It's our responsibility, whether it be in the grocery store or in the highways, the hedges, and the byways. It's uh, our responsibility, if it's at the service station or the laundromat, it's our responsibility to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with others, that we have that multiplication, that others and others, and yea, even others, might come to know Christ as Savior and as Lord. These shepherds weren't embarrassed about Jesus. They weren't embarrassed about confronting the lost with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They weren't bothered by political correctness. They weren't bothered by the fact that some might reject and some might uh, say no or some might make fun of them. They were not bothered by the fact that time was at hand and there were other things that they could be doing, but they were not bothered by the fact that there are other things that they could be spending or investing their time in. They were concerned with telling everybody of what they had heard and what they had seen. That's their activity. They made known abroad. Notice the audience. Verse 18, and all they that heard it wondered. That literally means they were amazed. They were amazed. It did not fall on deaf ears. Everybody that heard these shepherds witnessing and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, Yeshua Messiah, has been born. Everybody that heard it were simply amazed at what they heard. Perhaps they were amazed because here, these lowly workers called shepherds, that's telling these others, perhaps in higher positions in life, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
They were perhaps amazed because these shepherds were so zealous and so passionate about what they were saying. There's a vast difference in having a passion born out of a life experience than simply regurgitating words as we share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As we share the truth of the gospel with others, they can tell if it's real or, and if it's relevant or if it is absolutely false and fallacious. They can tell based on the zeal and the passion. And these shepherds said, let us now go with zeal and passion, concern and interest. Everyone heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm sure some believed, some received, and some rejected it. But all were confronted with the witness of these shepherds. All were confronted with the fact that these shepherds had shared the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They, were all, uh, they had all seen uh, what uh, uh, they were sharing with others, and they wanted others to see and to hear what they had seen and heard. Walk with me through a moment, with, for a moment what I call the hallways of hell. Back during the days of evangelism on the road, I preached a message called the hallways of hell on a multitude of times, vast number of occasions. And picture for your life and for mine the opportunities that's failed, the privileges to share the gospel as the shepherds had shared the good news and our failure to do so. Walk with me in our mind's eye for a moment through the hallways of hell. Hear those screeching, screaming voices of those that are tortured in the flames of that place called hell. They would be screaming and saying these words. I was your son, your child. You didn't tell me about Jesus. Why didn't you tell me about Jesus Christ? I was your co-worker. Why didn't you tell me about Jesus I was your laundry attendant. Why didn't you tell me about Jesus? Why didn't you say something with every opportunity, week after week? Why didn't you tell me about Jesus Christ? I was your grocery bag boy. Why didn't you tell me about Jesus? I was your son, your daughter, your mother, your father, your grandparents. I was the one that saw you each day, loved and uh, cared for you each day. Why didn't you tell me about Jesus Christ and the need to know him as Savior and as Lord? I was your neighbor. Why didn't you tell me about Jesus? Why didn't you take the moment out of your busy time and share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ that would have prevented me from being in this place called hell why why can you answer that for a moment why 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 didn't you tell me about Jesus their audience was amazed the scripture says what if the shepherds had not witnessed what if they had not gone to tell? What if they had not said this to others uh, in relationship to what they'd seen and they'd heard? What would have been the response? How would they have been uh, accountable before God for what they'd seen and heard and then their activity had been less than we see in the Scripture? The shepherd's personal decision recorded. The shepherd's personal dedication revealed. But I want you to notice in verse 19 and 20 the shepherd's personal delight reviewed. Notice verse 19, there's a little difference there. Verse 19, it has a little parenthetical inset. It's talking about the shepherds, what they'd done, where they'd gone, what they'd seen, what they'd heard, etc. And then it says, but Mary kept all of these things and pondered them in her heart. But then in verse 20, notice what the scripture says. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Notice as we close the shepherd's personal delight. Notice their approach. And the shepherds returned. And they had heard the story about Jesus. Messiah's birth. They had gone. They had experienced it firsthand. They had seen it with their own eyes. They had seen Mary and Joseph and Jesus just as the angel had told them that they would find. And they were rejoicing as a result of it. And they returned, that is, they left from the place where they were introduced to Jesus Christ. 
They left there and they went back to their homes, back to their families, back to their neighborhoods, back to their uh, shepherd's care of watching their sheep uh, and their flock by night. And they came back home to tell others. They returned to their homes and their jobs and their families, their friends and their neighbors, and they told them all about what they had heard and what they had seen. They weren't silent at all. You won't see any indication in the word study of the Scripture where there were silence on their part. You won't find anything in the Scripture in relationship to the text where somehow, some way, they had a laid-back attitude, let someone else do it. You see, one of the things that I find today that's antithetical to all of the biblical text in relationship to the Great Commission text, there are five places in the Scripture where we find the Great Commission, and I find it so antithetical to those truths in the Scripture where so many today as Christians have the philosophy and the mindset that I'll just find a good church, I'll be active, I'll be involved, I'll be there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, I'll pray, I'll give my tithes and offerings, but I have no responsibility to tell anybody what I know about Jesus Christ. That's simply not biblical truth. Everyone under the sound of my voice, we all have the responsibility of impacting lives with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ every place we go, everybody we see, every day, in our homes, in our families, with our friends, with our relatives, with our neighbors, with those that we come in contact with every day. My bride and I find the fields are white under harvest. <laughs> We can go out shopping or eating and find on almost every occasion God places a door that when opened, we can share the gospel of Jesus Christ, present a witness. The transliteration of the text in Matthew 28, verse 16 through 20, literally says, while going, you disciple." while going, you disciple. That is called lifestyle evangelism. Everybody we meet, every place that we go, and the first-hand illustration of it is found in this text with these shepherds as they were going and telling. And as they went back home, each one going their different direction perhaps, but God wants us to be witnesses for Jesus right here where we are every day telling others how to find Jesus Christ. These shepherds wanted their friends and their family and their co-workers to know the same Savior that they had been introduced to. They were excited about the good news. Does it excite us anymore that Jesus Christ came and died? Does it excite us anymore to know that we have the truth and we have the responsibility as bearers of the truth to share that good news with others? Does it excite and challenge us that God has placed in us that responsibility and that uh, trust with the Word of God that we can be trustworthy to share the Word with others? Most churches drop and die as a result of dead Christians. I'm not talking about physically dead, spiritually dead unwilling to be found faithful in impacting the lives of others with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's their approach. Their approach was to return and share the good news, taking part in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that the Savior's come. Notice the attitude in that 20th verse as we close. The Scripture says, glorifying and praising God glorifying and praising God. Their lives personally had been changed. Oh, what a change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, as the song goes. If there's that joy, 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 where? That joy, 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 down in my heart. If that joy is there, we ought to share it with others. That's the Christmas story. That's the Christmas challenge. That's the challenge that Christ came. That's the challenge that we ought to share with the world that's about us. When a person has been changed by the encounter with Jesus Christ, you can't shut up. You can't be still. You can't be silent. It's, in, it's an impossibility to be silent after we have come to know Christ as Savior and as Lord. May I remind us, as we see in that old song, oh, what a change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. 
we ought to be rejoicing each and every day as the shepherds were, praising the Lord for the privilege, for the opportunity, for the freedom to be ambassadors for Christ and sharing the good news of the gospel with the world. The world wants to forget Christmas until next year. The world wants to put it aside until the 25th of December of next year. But the challenge for the Christian, the challenge for the Christian today, the challenge for every believer today is to go and tell every day, everybody, everywhere that the Savior has come. His name is Jesus Christ. That ought to excite and challenge everyone under the sound of my voice. Not only that the Savior's come, but the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, lived and died on Calvary's cross and shed his rich red royal blood that through our faith and trust in him we might have everlasting life, eternal life. Two things as we close. Number one, do you know him personally? Have you said yes to Jesus Christ as Savior? If not, why not? If you've said yes to Christ, you need not say amen or oh me. When's the last time you told someone about it? When's the last time you took the uh, opportunity and had the privilege of stating as the Apostle Paul did so often, once I was blind, but now I see. I was dead, but now I'm alive. That's the simplistics of the gospel of Jesus Christ, of sharing the truth of what he's done in your life and what he can do in the lives of others. Would you stand, please, as we stand?